Okay, as in go. Sorry, one second. Fork Tales, a podcast that feeds the food and beverage world. Oh, awesome. Fork Tales is brought to you by Vigor, a branding and marketing agency for passion driven, innovative restaurant, beverage, and hospitality brands. Learn more at vigorbranding.com. If you love what we're serving up, please give Fork Tales a five star review on your podcast service of choice. Think of it as a tip for good service. Hey everyone, today I am joined by Ricky Verman. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Peach State Hospitality Group, a client that uh, we at Vigor have been working with for a while on a number of projects uh, who we adore. We collaborate really well um, and always looking forward to what's next. And uh, we brought him in today to talk about hotels, hospitality, and this spring back from the effects of the pandemic uh, and what's next. So Ricky, say hello and give a little bit of backstory. Sure. Uh, first off, Joseph, thank you uh, so much for the warm, warm introduction and uh, good to be here. Good to always uh, uh, chat. It seems like every time that you and I get together, we can always uh, geek out over all things hospitality and F&B and all the good stuff. So uh, definitely a natural conversation. Uh, yeah, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Ricky Rahman. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving as uh, the chief operating officer for Peach to Hospitality. Uh, we're a 35 year old firm. Uh, predominantly uh, in the select service and extended stay space. Uh, we've built hotels all across from two-story exterior corridors to you know major big box uh, hotels all across the Southeast. And now our geographic footprint is growing. Um, Joseph, as you know, we've done some stuff in Texas, working on some stuff in California, um, in Charleston, this, that, and the other. So um, yeah, good to be here and good to always have a conversation. Awesome. Yeah. So what has been some of the motivating beliefs at Peach State Hospitality, uh, the beliefs that drive growth, and, and how do you identify new opportunities? Sure. You know, sh- short of sounding, um, you know, kitschy, but, you know, one of the things that we've, you know, really looked at is, you know, what's the company kind of driving for from a associate standpoint and offering standpoint and where we would want to grow. And it all comes back to making it meaningful, right? Investment by virtue or experience by virtue um, really has to have a meaningful taste for those that are creating the experience and those that are experiencing it. So, you know, at the company, delivering a meaningful experience is kind of something core to where do we want to build, right? Where, what markets we want to be, what kind of offering we want to grow to. Um, and, and what drives us is this ability that hospitality uh, evolves every single day. And I think for us, you know, having that ability to be able to be there as it evolves and as a part of the evolution is something um, fun and it's something exciting and it always kind of keeps us on our toes. So, you know, trying to figure out what's around the corner as the market shift, as the consumer sentiment shifts, as the technology shifts in our space, trying to be ahead of the curve and trying to provide um, experiences for our employees, for our staff and for our investors and our guests uh, is something that drives us, you know, each and every day. That's great. So we're, you know, um, Peach State is is based in Warner Robins, Georgia, which isn't too far from Atlanta. Yep. Um, but a lot of your properties aren't in Georgia, like you mentioned. You're you're kind of expanding out across the nation. Um, what are the challenges from the operations standpoint uh, when dealing with that distance? Sure. Uh, you know, a, a couple operational challenges. Right. First and foremost is you know having a company where you have internal leadership growth it becomes a little bit tougher to grow your core leadership to other markets, right? It, it, that promote from within culture becomes a bit tougher for us to execute upon uh, because you're in a market where you don't have a footprint, you don't have a, you know, a, a long-term foothold. So finding the right talent um, is, is a challenge, but I think we've, we've succeeded on that front. It takes a little bit, t- a little bit more time, but um, you know, we, we found that coming into a market and understanding our peers and understanding our, our community in the hospitality space Great talent always kind of you know happens to knock on our door. So that's number one. Number two is um, kind of the geographic footprint, right? One of the things that we've learned, even in the state of Georgia, that different different municipalities and different locales 
have different needs from an offering standpoint, have different rules and regulations from how to operate, what the operating procedures are. Um, so navigating that is always a challenge, but I think the more you do it, the more you get used to it. Um, and, and the biggest thing I would say is understanding what the market is going to do and, and trying to position yourself as certain markets evolve, right? When you're in a particular market for a long time, you can build together a track record or an understanding of the ebbs and flows of seasonalities of, of certain areas of business where you can focus on coming into a new market. It always poses a challenge of not having that historical data. So it's a, it's a challenge up front, but over time, as you progress in the market, um, you build a good track record, you build a good understanding of how to really offer a great experience in the market and you kind of build that route afterwards. That's amazing. So you mentioned that um, in, in the portfolio, it's mostly extended stay and select service yep. uh, brands, which is really interesting because usually those brands aren't known for F&B food and beverage outlets, yet you, you found a way to, I think, make some very great bold statements with adding F&B to brands that wouldn't necessarily have it beyond the prepackaged, sure. you know, Marriott Bistro or or whatever. So what drove the decisions there? And um, th this isn't a plug for Vigor, but what sure. was the vision in, in bringing that out and making it a reality? Sure. You know, a, you know, a couple thoughts, right? So first and foremost, it's really understanding what the market needs, right? You know, it, it does no good, as you well know, Joseph, it doesn't, it does no good for a business owner or a bar owner or a restaurant owner to put a product in a market that's oversaturated, um, you know, under traveled, or you're not going to get the, you know, the real growth and goal out of the business, right? So one, knowing our markets and knowing where, hey, you know, for instance, we can use Dallas as an example, you know, you're in a heavy corporate market, there's not a rooftop bar in, in you know, in the local area that provides an, uh, an opportunity for us right then and there, just from a location standpoint. Um, number two to that is, is that, you know, if you look at the U.S. traveler or even the, the inbound traveler from Europe and however people are traveling in, in America, you know, there is a big unit number of branded hotels. Right. And those branded hotels are, are built predominantly on consistency, which is a great thing for a consumer. It's a great thing from an operator standpoint. Um, you know, consistency in that product is always key. Right. But having an ability to differentiate yourself. Right. So having an ability to provide an offering in a market where it's needed, one, and two, where a guest walks into a historical hotel that wouldn't have this level of offering and say, oh, wow, you know, I'm getting something above and beyond what I would normally get at the normal other branded hotel. Right. So that's that's always a core part of how do we going back to my earlier point of how do we elevate the experience from what we've already been given or what we've already been used to. Um, adds value, obviously, from a, from a financial standpoint, but also adds value from an intrinsic local standpoint, right? One of the things, as you guys know, um, creating an offering where the locals like it and the locals want to be a part of it is very important versus just the guest, right? Because the guests are going to be there because they have to be at the hotel. But what what is the other offering that people from the area want to be around? So creating these spaces, creating these environments, um, and, and, you know, put it to put it bluntly too. you know, F and B good F and B is fun, right? It's, it's good. It's a good, fun environment to be in. It's a good, exciting thing to do. It's, it's always fun to create experiences for guests where, you know, at a, at a, at a courtyard by Marriott, you wouldn't expect a really nice rooftop bar with great sweeping views and a great brand and a great cocktail, um, aside from what the brand already has prototypically. So it, it's always fun to be able to surprise and delight as well. Yeah, I think one of the one of the problems that we've seen with hotels, well, pre pandemic, uh, at least from the brand level, like the IHGs, the Marriotts, like stellar F and B outlets were the big push. They they wanted to see um, owner gr ownership groups and, and management groups create uh, world class experiences, sure. but it seems very few and far between stateside. Specifically in, in Europe, it's it's kind of com not commonplace in a bad way, but you know that if you go to a restaurant and a hotel, it's going to be rock star. It's going to be great. Um, but like you said, here stateside, it's we, we almost fell in love with uniformity and consistency. And, you know, the Marriott burger in D.C. or Bethesda area is going to be the same Marriott burger that you have in California. 
good burger. And it's just right. It is a good burger, which is yeah, I, yeah. I, I love to like take some jabs at it, but I'll definitely eat it. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so it was definitely a pivotal shift to say stateside specifically. We need to start taking F and B much more seriously as ownership groups in, in hospitality management companies. But that uh, there's a there's an operational ask there where I think a lot more more often that is missed, and that is the bifurcation of this is the restaurant and bar, and that's how this is operated, and then over here is the hotel, and that's how this is operated. And cross pollination is really difficult to execute well. How have you tackled that challenge? Yeah. So, you know, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head, right? So execution in this space, particularly as you're going from hotel to F&B or, or you know, BNF experience, your experiential um, offerings, execution is kind of the, the biggest um, juggernaut, but it's also the biggest opportunity, right? So one of the things that is actually helpful, right? You can't, I guess for us, what's been really beneficial is having hotels that have an existing F&B outlet in there, I think gives you a, a learning curve already of how this you know union is going to work, right? So how a, a really well run and operating F&B outlet inside of a hotel, um, you know, if you look at the Courtyards or Hilton Garden Inns or the AC brand or the Moxie brand, you know, you have to figure out how that works for that brand already, right? So taking that and evolving that is always a natural step. It's always an easy step. And again, I think it also comes from historical talent, right? Like having people on our team who've been great restaurant managers, great bar managers, great openers of, of spaces. I think that's so, such a core part because, you know, there's something so consistent in the F&B world, right? If you look at how the offerings change, but the operations stay relatively the same, right? A, a restaurant... Um, running at a high efficiency or a high turnover rate, they're, they're some of the same things that you have to do consistently regardless of the product offering, right? So that's one of the things that we figured out or we were aspiring to learn is what are the consistent things that every great restaurant or every great bar has to have that are non-negotiables and obviously, you know, clean, comfortable service, great food, a great staff, a great warm, welcoming staff and making things easier for the consumer, right? So, so we started with the basics, right? So let's let's get the basics of the ex- execution down pat, and then we can figure out how to evolve and grow and become more market specific and more market um, receptive. Uh, but again, that execution part uh, takes trial and error, right? As you well know, there are a lot of instances where you know even ourselves we've experienced where um, it doesn't always go well, right? F and B and and that experiential amenity uh, is a tough. Um, thing to master over time, but, you know, trial and error and, and making those mistakes and understanding the consumer more and more makes the execution a lot easier. And I think it, it always comes to, we tell our teams all the time, you know, it's, you've got to understand the guest because if you don't understand the guest, you can't offer what they're looking for. And, and regardless of what our offering is, we can have the best brand, the best food, the best um, offering on our side, we still have to make the consumer happy. And I think the execution side works backwards on that front. Yeah, yeah. You know, I would almost uh, imagine that because the basis of a great hotel experience is rooted in service. I know that sounds very silly, but like we're there to accommodate. These are accommodations. We're there to take care of you. We're there to make sure that your needs are not just met, but exceeded, that that could easily bleed into an elevated um, restaurant experience. And, And yet there's still, I think, a stigma with restaurant that exist in hotels yeah. uh, from the standard American consumer. Um, how do you think we fight that? How do you think we start to change the minds of people? I mean, the obvious one is just make sure they're all amazing. So people start to right. learn. Um, but how do we start to trigger that behavioral shift and that perceptual shift in your opinion? Yeah. You know, it, w- one of the interesting things, that I, and, I, and I think it starts with transparency, right? And, and I think that's what gets lost in kind of this, test uh, trial and error thing that we know that all not all offerings are going to be great right as consumers we know that as as developers we know that but i think that having that transparency of hey we're we're testing hey we're trying something new hey we're you know do a pop up or do something uh, you know letting the consumer know that we're not trying to give you a fully polished product out the gate we're trying to go on this journey with you where you know, we can offer something new at the breakfast time during lunch or during the evening and kind of trial and error and figure out what the consumer is telling us. Because 
one of the things I think, you know, we've all learned is that authenticity is key, right? You can't just copy and paste a particular offering in any different market. Something that works in Manhattan isn't going to work in Denver, right? Or something that works in Denver isn't going to work in Miami. So, you know, having that transparency of we're trying something, we're trying to push the envelope, we're trying to give something elevated, you know, I think consumers receive that well when they're told up front, hey, you know, this is something new, there's something exciting versus check out our pre-packaged perfect solution. That's when you set up the, for disappointment, right? Because the expectations are so high. So again, you know, low expectations over exceeding is always a, a great, you know, perspective on that. And I think also it's it's making fans, right? It's, you know, so many business travelers and as the business traveler or even leisure traveler segment has changed, you know, making fans of the new, making fans of the unseen, making fans of, hey, I want to go to a hotel that has a separate bar or restaurant offering that I wouldn't get anywhere else and, and making people seek that out. I think, you know, short of having everyone per every one of them perfect, you know, having good experiences and bad experiences now is teaching the consumer that maybe it's okay to go to a really nice rooftop bar at a Hampton Inn, right? Or at a Fairfield or at a courtyard where historically you wouldn't have seen it. And now you can still have a great experience at a great cost and a great price point. Um, so again, it's, it's kind of the consumer part um, education too. Yeah, it's, it's funny you said uh, about New York brand not working in Denver uh, specifically because there is a New York brand that is working in Denver. Um, right. Not not to say that you're wrong. It, it's, right. it's, a, it's definitely an anomaly. Right. Um, but the, the Death & Co. bar at the Ramble Hotel, mm -hmm. absolutely remarkable. Um, if you haven't been there, I do suggest going. However, talking about, um, I guess, brand experience, I, I stopped in. I was not staying at the Ramble, but I did stop in because I wanted to have a drink at the bar and just experience it. And it's a beautiful spot, very beautiful spot. And for those that don't know, um, we at Vigor curate uh, a blog called Grits and Grids, where we not only find um, branding and marketing and packaging and design projects from around the world specific to food and beverage and, and hospitality and share them and critique them and yada, yada. Uh, we also will write what we call firsthand, which is, okay, I was here. This is what I saw. This is what I experienced This from a brand, food, full experiential um, angle. And so I asked if I could take some photos of the space for that purpose to review it on our site. And the manager told me it was going to be $500 that I would have to pay him to take photos of their bar to promote it on our blog. And uh, I was like, right, so no, I'm right. not going to pay you for right. Right. taking photos of your bar. Um, it was just a very funny moment because, you know, the more I thought about it, it's like <clears throat> they must have a problem with influencers. Right. You know, they must have an issue with people who aren't staying there, coming in, taking photos of themselves. Right. And maybe I didn't do a good job of explaining it, um, that I was taking photos of their bar to talk about their bar. Right. Um but that's an interesting phenomenon that happens, I think, with a lot of hotels that have an experience of that caliber. Have you experienced that, the whole influencer um, manipulation thing, I guess we'll call it? You know, it's it's um, interesting. So in Dallas, we didn't. But believe it or not, we're already getting some early chatter uh, in Charleston, right? Obviously, you can imagine I believe it. Charleston is a major market for for influencers you know in the fashion space and the F&B space and the you know makeup space and in the experiential space um big market for it right so we're already getting reached out to about you know ways to partner ways to leverage and that's always a tough um go right it's always an interesting thing cuz one we've never experienced that as a developer we've never had someone say hey look let me use your space to promote my product or your product so that's a learning in and of itself but it's also a thing where, you know, the age old thing of you don't know how it's going to go in the future, right? You could sign on with a particular person or, or allow them to use your space. And then all of a sudden, you know, they get canceled, right? Or something happens and all of a sudden there's negative impacts for mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. right? you know, so there's all these things that we have to kind of think through. But um, it, it's such an interesting conundrum how, how to manage that relationship with, with the influencers, right? Because on one hand, you want to get the word out, right? But on the other hand, you want to keep it authentic. You want to keep it real. You want to keep it uh, less curated, right? You want people to kind of happen, happen to you know step into it. 
Um, so it, it's going to be an interesting journey. I, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. You know, we, we're trying to understand uh, the goals of influencers too, because everyone kind of has their different thing. Um, but again, we, you know, it's our first go, and I'll, I'm happy to report back once we open and see how it goes. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to figure out um, the nuances of it because you know we, we've heard horror stories. I believe it yeah. was in uh, uh, North England or or Scotland where. This, the owner of the inn just basically on social media called out this influencer for trying to just get free stay, free accommodations, free amenities, right. uh, everything for free. So she could go there and take some photos and then put it on her Instagram. And, and, and he just he I think he was right in this one. He's like, if I did this, I wouldn't be open like uh, for everyone that reaches out. Um, so there's got to be some sort of middle ground. But then there's also that little. Uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, the little Jiminy cricket. That's sort of like, yeah, but they will be promoting the spot. So may, you know, and, and if we don't do it, you know, the competitor down the street's going to do it. So yeah. maybe entertain the idea, but they're, I think they need to learn to like, I think come to a middle ground where, yeah. Hey, maybe it's a discount based on the number of subscribers or followers you have. And yeah. I, I don't know. I think it's still uncharted territory, but I think what, what I've also seen is that, the major influencers are actually losing their traction because of that authenticity that you mentioned. It's like, yeah, we know that Jane or John, you're running around and you're only going to places that are offering you free stuff. So do we really trust your word here? You know? And uh, so that's an interesting phenomenon that's developing as we speak. Um, All of this on top of God forbid I say the P word again. It's like, (laughs) I'm saying it more in 2021 than I did in 2020. Obviously, hotels were hit extremely hard by the pandemic. No travel, uh, the accommodations, all the amenities shut down. And I know that everyone's talking about labor uh, shortages in restaurants, but hotels, it's compounded. So oh, yeah. how, how are you approaching this? Um, how are you tackling the challenges? How are you attracting talent back? Yeah. And uh Yeah. Let's let's no, dig into that big one. <laughs> no, for sure, and, and it's a it's a unfortunate it's a household conversation right now, and I, and I think it's just a sign of the times, right? But you know, we're we're very confident in in just our ability over the long term or even midterm of you know patience gets rewarded in this time, right? And that's one of the things that we've kind of gone back to the drawing board of. You know, it's not just us, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in the hospitality space all across from F&B for quick service restaurants or everywhere you go, you know, we've, we realize it's not just us, right? So it, we're all in this together, um, number one. Number two, I think, you know, having upfront conversations with the talent of what the goals are, right? And it's that's one of the things that's more important now more so than ever of, of identifying the job versus the career, right? Identifying what are the goals of a particular employee or a particular candidate? And do we feel like we're the right fit for them as they want to grow in their careers and whatever their needs are, right? Because having that upfront conversation makes for a more meaningful employment, first off. And I think that's one of the things that as people are getting back into the workforce again, or trying to figure out what, you know, 2.0 of their lives look like, um, you know, our thought is that let's be patient. Let's understand, you know, whatever comes our way is great because we, we, you can't really force it right now, right? You can't force a situation where there isn't that many um, applicants to begin with, right? You can't force a particular person who's underqualified or is excelling in a different mar- department to put them in this mar- department. It becomes a tougher challenge, right? So one of the things that you know, we're testing out is obviously, you know, incentives all up and down the board. That's always a big thing for our, you know, hiring bonuses, you know, longevity bonuses. I'm sure everybody's doing that, right? But it's, it's not just the dollars and cents. I think that understanding how people's lives have changed and what they need out of us as an employer um, helps us better position. Because look, if you go on any exit or any market that we work on, we know we have five competitors across the street. And not only are we competing on the hotel space, we're competing for a labor pool from management all the way to hourly to where it's restaurants, it's bars, it's Amazon, it's Target, it's Walmart, any of these big box retailers, along with hotels, right? So our pool of people has grown, but also our ability to be competitive and ability to offer, um, you know, certain offerings is, is limited too, right? So 
Um, one of the things that we've learned, it's hospitality talent will always come to hospitality, right? Those that are great and those that have it in the blood, be a great bartender or a great server or a great front desk agent or a great housekeeping agent um, will always come to the space, right? So um, trying to be patient right now, trying to, you know, let things shake out, let people kind of put their lives back together, um, you know, reaching out to our old associates, seeing where they are and, you know, trying to just take it one day at a time. Um, you know, I- I'm sure you're, you're hearing stories of, you know, corporate staff and above property staff rolling up their sleeves and helping out. And, you know, we're all hands on deck. Um, we've got a great team. So, you know, when housekeeping's low, we're rolling up our sleeves, we're doing laundry, you know, we're, we're mopping floors, cleaning the parking lot. So whatever it takes just to get us there. And, you know, our industry, you know, you know, too, Joseph, f and is very resilient, right? We, 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 we take the dip, right? We take the dip hard and we, and we, it, we, we weather through, we, we've made it through multiple economic cycles. Um, nothing quite like the, the P word, but, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> and resilience and kind of that collective effort, um, you know, having brothers and sisters in the F and B space and we're kind of sharing that, um, the journey together, I think we'll, we'll make it through. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and I think uh, some of the things that you're mentioning there are definitely uh, represented by Mr. Rupesh uh, Patel, uh, who, who who's all over LinkedIn and showing pictures of him doing laundry in the laundry yeah. room. And, you know, that's just that's just a hallmark of a great leader, someone who is not not unafraid and not hesitant to, like you said, roll up the sleeves, get dirty. Um, I'll, I'll get in the trenches, as it were, um, with my people. And, you know, when I look at the hotel industry, there is a bit of an issue in attracting talent compared to other industries. Yeah. And and that's the fact that people don't really know who Peach State Hospitality Group is. Sure. They know Courtyard Dallas. Yeah. They know Marriott. They, they know, you know, they know that brand. Um, and so trying to attract folks to the channels that would help you talk about culture and sell the idea yeah. is, is a bit more difficult. And it's akin to uh, franchise franchise companies, um, you know, like a large group that uh, one of our other clients, Showstack is what they're called. And they're in Michigan and they own Applebee's, they own Del Tacos, and they own this brand called Olga's. Uh, so brands like that, where it's like not many people know what Showstack is. Right. Um, and, and so when you're marketing, it's like you're hoping that they're attracted, I guess, to the hotel brand or the, or the restaurant in the hotel. Um, and then get introduced to Peach State, but that's a big barrier to overcome. Um, I don't have solutions for it on the on on this podcast, but it's it's definitely uh, it's definitely bumpy. Like you know, when we go to market with looking for new talent, whether it's a copywriter, designer, account person, it's pretty, you're going to work for Vigor. Yeah. Like that that's this is the company. Right. Um, it'd be really different if it was like, oh yeah, Vigor's the face, but the real company is over here, and you've never heard of them. So right. what are you really buying into? And that's something that we were challenged with when we were working with Marriott International to talk about um, upgrading F and B. It's like, yeah, yeah, we're talking about the Marriott portfolio, but the experience at Peach State Hospitality Groups can be very different than yeah. the experience from, you know, X Y Z Hospitality Group out of Timbuktu. Right. Um, and and how can you ensure that the employment is of the same caliber? Yeah. Um, and that well, that's sticky. It, it is. It's it's the it's a it's a sticky situation, right? And, and again, it, it comes back to, you know, relying on your company's laurels of how can you permeate a culture um, or how can you disseminate a culture from a, a central source and how can you kind of break that apart and create individual versions of it, right? And that's kind of the challenge, right? Is that, you know, a company can have a culture, but when you have multiple outlets and multiple locations, you have to multiply that culture over and over and over again. And then by multiplying it, there's room for error, room for bad apples, room for evolution that is different from the company culture that's core, right? So um, again, it's, there's no perfect answer. I, I, I think that going back to the top of the conversation, right, about consistency, I think that's where consistency really helps. Um, if you're consistent in your culture um, and, and consistent from location to location, you can kind of create a sub um, persona underneath the Marriott brand, right? And that's what we're all, if you ask any owner operator in our space, 
It's, hey, we under we understand we operate under a license agreement, under a franchise agreement of this brand, and, and we're obviously going to do the things that make it consistent, right? But now we, as a manager and owner, have to do things that are consistent to us, right? So, and, and it's really interesting, right? If you were to go and look at 10 hotels for 10 different management companies, you could be able to tell which ones are under which company because they if they're doing it the right way and if they're experienced enough, you can see that there's a culture of how they operate and how they think. And that's kind of the the bigger challenge of how do we get the culture to multiply over and over again. Um, but again, you know, it, it wouldn't be fun if it, if it was easy. Right. So that, that's one of the, the fun parts about it is, is making <laughs> right. we can, uh, you know, have these conversations and, and it goes back to the talent, right? If we pick the right talent, they, they're a quick study. They can get, get get to understanding what the end goals are quicker. And it all comes back to why, right? And that's one of the things in our business, I think, um, if I can say, kind of has fallen short a little bit of explaining the why up and down the scale, right? Why do we do what we do? Why do we offer what we offer? Why do we train the way we train? And if we start with the why and end with the why, how becomes so much more easier, right? The execution becomes exponentially easier if people truly understand on a half a page what we're doing, why we're doing it, and you know, allowing them to use their experience to help guide how we're going to get there. Because every how is different, right? You've, you talk about that brand from New York to Denver, the, the why is the same, right? I would imagine, but how they're getting there from New York versus Denver is where you rely on your people. And I think that's the important part is just being really transparent of, of why we do what we do. Yeah, and, and that makes a lot of sense. One of the things that I think a lot of um, company leaders miss the mark on when it comes to attracting labor and um, securing labor, I actually hate the word labor, so like team members, mm-hmm. uh, internal patrons, if we're going to use bigger terms, um, <laughs> the, is that, Yes, money talks. Yes, benefits do help. Um, but there's one key that I think a lot of folks don't really tap into, and it's connecting the dots between the impact that you will have that's measurable and, and noticeable as an employee of this company. So yes, you're the manager. You're in charge of XYZ. Here are your job responsibilities. Here's your procedures. When you do this above and beyond, this happens and whatever that this is, is uh, something spectacular. So they can feel that there's meaning behind and that's, that's essentially the why playing out. So here's why we do it. And then here's the impact. Here's how you will change every guest that walks through the door's life. You're, you're going to change their life. And yep. um, I, I think the, the companies that do that, like you said, y- you know, them. Um, yep. so a couple last questions here and then we'll, we'll land the plane. Um, what's on the horizon for Peach State? What's what's in the future here coming up? Uh, growth, 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 right? Um, you know, we're we're in a position where we're very fortunate and very blessed to be able to have great partners um, all up and down the stack, right? We have a great team, great partners. And I think, you know, hospitality, you know, yes, 2020 was a bumpy road, but, you know, having that bumpy road further just solidifies our, um, intentions to be really purposeful and really focused. Right. And, you know, our business is a specialist business, right? You can't be half in, right. You have to be hundred percent in, in order to even get to sea level, right. In order to excel, you gotta be 110% in, right. So, you know, we're doubling down on the space. We're, we're, we're very confident in the hospitality space as it comes back and as it grows um, and growing um, in different markets, right? You know, we, we our, our Dallas deal that we did, which you, were, you guys were a part of, um, our Charleston deal, um, you know, we're doing a hotel in downtown Charleston, which you guys were a part of. We're excited about that. So, you know, our, our growth, um, we're focusing on markets where it's really fun to be, right? One of the things that you and I think I said a long time ago is that if you want to put a hotel everywhere, I want a vacation, right? And uh, that's that's our one of our overarching goals is everywhere we want to be we want to have a hotel there right, um, but, but it's also going into markets where we feel like we can execute right we feel that our track records um, good enough to kind of deal with the local challenges and there's an opportunity to create something fun create something exciting so you know we're growing from coast to coast we're trying to find new growing markets where it's fun to be and. Um, one of the cool things is that the U.S. is kind of busting at the seams in certain markets, right? You look at a lot of these pockets in America where 
that that city that's 15 minutes north of town is now growing and it's now creating its own community. It's out having a need for a great hotel offering or great F&B offering. Those are the places where we want to be where um, it, it, it might not be the glitzy, you know, midtown and downtown in Maine, but it's a great experience where local people want to be and, and guests are traveling to. So uh, we're excited to kind of, you know, continue the model and continue growing as much as we can. I love it. F- final question. Uh, a final bite to eat and drink at one of the F&B outlets in your, in, in your portfolio. What are you eating? What are you drinking? Hmm. Final F and B. It could be passed. Uh, it could be passed. Okay. Well, you know my answer on that one. So in a former hotel, we we had our uh, old fashioned that we did with the toasted pecans, which was unbelievable. So that'll be one of the one of the final drinks. And then final final bite, uh, anything savory. If it's on the menu and it's savory, I think that's the final bite. I'm a big fan of trying bars fries. I think that it's a great telltale story of, you know, it's a simple situation. You take them out, you fry them, you serve them up. But uh, you can tell a lot about a space on the attention to detail on a simple fry because a lot of guests, even for me, you're, you're not looking for a whole lot of uh, food, but you're looking for enough to kind of, you know, quench the palate. So um, any, any level of fries for any of our hotels. I love it. Yeah. Fry, uh, fries are the indicator. I um, yeah. famously had intense discussions uh, with a, a restaurant we were working on back in 2011. Um, it, just for the record, when I say intense discussions, it's is with a gentleman from two gentlemen from Israel. So you know that the right. intentions get very, very intense. Very passionate. Uh, right, right. Very passionate, very intense. If yeah. you don't know, people may think that you're yelling at each other, but you're not. And I, I was team Yukon Gold Potato mm. French fries. And I, mm-hmm. and it was one of those I will die on that hill. I right. will, I will have that battle and I will perish if I have to, cause it was that important. Right. And they finally, you know, bought in and it, it was worth it. They got so many great reviews on their Yukon gold potato fries. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's interesting, right? Not to take too much of your time, but you know, it's interesting how there's the fry, right? But behind the fry, there's so much more, right? Which potato, how are you going to fry? How are you going to season it? And I feel like that's the differentiator of a great spot, right? Whether it's whether it's fries or any other food, right? There's there's the textbook items that you're going to get, right, from a, from a naming standpoint. But there lies the opportunity too, right? Of like, for instance, you pick the Yukon Gold Potato, you have experience, you know that without a shadow of a doubt, it's a great product, right? You can do whatever you want to, you're going to have a great fry, right? So, that, so I think that's really important of understanding the, the backstory behind anything that's on the menu, um, and anything from a service level too, I think it's really important of understanding the backstory on it. So can, can the viewers, listeners, and fans of Fork Tales expect a new podcast from Ricky Ramon called Behind the Fry? A- absolutely. That's a, I mean, <laughs> you heard it here first, right? That's right. <laughs> Joseph and I are going to do a, a nationwide tour where we're interviewing, interviewing all fry makers. Yeah. Yeah. And then our second tour will be uh, on a treadmill trying to get rid of all the yeah. meat that we ate. Yeah. Um, well, Ricky, thank you so much for your time and insights. Yeah. Uh, this has been brilliant. Where can people find Peach State and how can they connect with you? Uh, Peach State, uh, you can find us on our website at PSHGA.com. We're on LinkedIn at Peach State Hospitality. You can find uh, you know, us. We're communicating and participating in all um, you know, the conferences. Um, but again, you know, we're only a phone call away. We're only an email away. Uh, the best way to connect with us is obviously via our social media channels. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, thank you, Joseph, and thank you to the Vigor team. You guys are doing outstanding work. Uh, it's always a, a breath of fresh air to work with you guys. So great to have this conversation. Ah, thank you. Honored and humbled. Uh, thanks for your time. And we'll, we'll talk real soon. Sure. If you love what we served up, please follow us at Vigor Branding on Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Medium. Fork Tales is produced by the team at Vigor. Audio and video post productions provided by Zencaster. Music performed by Jet Trash and licensed through musicbed.com. Joseph handles his own hair, makeup, and stunts. Copyright 2003 to 2021. Vigor Graphic Design, LLC. All rights reserved.